Hello, everyone, and welcome to our USMLE prep series. Today, I am joined by Dr. Russell Heckburn, um, where he is going to help us dissect the USMLE prep question that we posed on our social medias back on December 16th. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Russell Heckburn. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? How are you doing? Nice to um, I'm Dr. Heckburn. I'm one of the counselors here at St. James School of Medicine. Uh, I'm here alongside my other counselors, uh, Dr. Chaudhary and Dr. Kinchelo. And yes, yeah, so this week we're going to be talking about the fight against inflammation. And, you know, as I normally do, I put a nice little comic up here just to remind <laughs> you that, you know, studying is always fun. It's it's how what you make of it. And it is the holidays, so, you know. It's the, <laughs> it's the to, season. Yep, yeah, it's <laughs> to bring in a little Rudolph humor in. So let's get started. All right. So the question. A 67-year-old man comes to the clinic with complaints of pain, redness, and swelling of his right pointy finger for the past day. The pain is 8 out of 10, non-radiated, and increases in pain with use of his right hand. The patient has not tried to treat the pain with any over-the-counter medication. His past medical history includes type 2 diabetes, ulcer disease, and hypertension. He does not know what his current medication list consists of. Patient's vital signs are within normal limits. Physical exam shows erythema and tenderness between his second metacarpal and second proximal phalanx. Serum uric acid levels are within normal limits. Aspiration of the synovial fluid from the affected joint demonstrates monosodium urate crystals. So the patient is most probably given a medication that has an inhibitory effect of which of the pathways um, below. So uh, what do you think? What does everyone think? So based off of social media, so we posed this question on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and there was kind of like a trickle of a few of the different answers. Most commonly, I saw C and D. Personally, I believe it's D, but I have a feeling you're going to explain why that's right or wrong. Of course, I'm going to explain why. What else would I be here? Why else would I be here? Exactly. <laughs> All right. So as I like to do, let's really break down the question okay. and find out the clues. All right. So first thing I like to do is, once again, ask the question and try to understand what's being asked. So the question is, the patient's most probably given the medication that in, has an inhibitor, inhibitory effect at some point in the pathway. So what does the medication inhibit? So looking here, it inhibits A, B, C, D, or E. So it looks here, it's inhibiting some part, pathway along the arachidonic acid metabolism. All right, so now we have to go through and see what medication you're going to treat to this condition. So we have to know what condition they have. Okay. All right, so I've gone ahead and highlighted the big clues to really pay attention to. Um, there's pain, redness, and swelling in, in his right pointy finger. So only one joint is affected. They even highlight which joint it is, the second metacarpal and uh, between the second metacarpal and second proximal phalanx. So one small area is affected. So you think of what can cause di uh, disease in one joint alone. I'm thinking septic arthritis, maybe degenerative joint disease if he uses his pointy finger a lot. Those are some options. But then they give us the aspiration of the synovial fluid, talks about, um, says there's monosodium urate crystals. And that should bring to mind every, to everyone's mind that gout. Gout mm -hmm. has monosodium urate crystals in joints. So now this is a patient with, joint, uh, with gout. They came in for treatment. So if think about what to treat them. We have to think about what conditions they have. And I've also highlighted, highlighted that they have ulcer disease, which means that if we're going to give them pain medication, we have to be careful that a medication is not going to trigger um, any ulcer disease, which makes sense because this pathway actually does involve somehow gastric tissue and protecting it. So we have to know which is the right drug to not worsen their disorder. Yeah. So now that we have those clues and we identify, it comes down to what are we going to inhibit? What do we inhibit to, to make sure this also disease doesn't get worse, uh, but we still able to treat the gout? So that makes the answer. D. D. There you go. So look at that. You, you know your stuff. You know, I'm learning. <laughs> all right. All right. So yeah, so we chose D. We want something that inhibits um, cyclooxygenase 2 only. Um, A and E is actually going along lipooxygenase, which is which I see more when it comes to treating asthma. Yeah. Um, it breaks down to affect the bronchial tone, um, neutrophil, chemotaxis, those are things that are involved, but it's mostly lungs. And the treatment that or the medication that inhibits those pathways, like A and E, is used primarily for asthma. So I gotcha. eliminate those immediately. So I'm looking at B, C, and D. And then out of them, I want just cyclooxygenase 2 alone, which makes B and C incorrect. All right. So 
What does this all mean? The arachidonic acid pathway essentially is formed. This is a nice page um, taken straight from first aid, page 49, first aid 2021, showing the arachidonic acid pathway. So at the very top, you see membrane phospholipids, which is just the cell membrane. If when it gets damaged or destroyed, it gets, it gets broken down and releases arachidonic acid. And it goes on two pathways. As I said, lipooxygenase um, converts it into um, leukotrienes, which is more so in the lungs. Mm -hmm. um, cyclooxygenase uh, breaks it down to cyclic endoperoxides, which is prostacycline, prostaglandins, and thromboxane. And from this page, you see there's a lot of effects. It affects uterine tone, affects vascular tone, affects platelet aggregation. There's a whole bunch of stuff. All right. So I wrote it down a little bit more just, you know, in case the picture didn't do it. <laughs> um, so once again, so when the uric acid deposit into the joint space, um, there is irritation of cell destruction, which leads to elevated arachidonic acid. Cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 transforms it into cyclic endoperoxides, which are then converted into prostacyclines, prostaglandins, and thromboxanes. Depends on where this occurs and what the product is will determine the symptoms. So thromboxane has to deal with platelet aggregation. So in the blood, if you have high levels of thromboxane, you can get like clots more, for example. Mm. All right. So when we're talking about gout and we want to treat gout, we have to think about an acute phase and a chronic phase. So in the acute phase of treating gout, we always try to um, reduce the inflammation. Okay. The crystals are already there. Neutrophil is already there. Dumping all these cytokines, trying to get rid of it. It's responding to all the arachidonic acid being produced. So we try to it, reduce the inflammation and that hope, then that actually helps bring pain relief because then the body will clear up the rest of the acid. Oh, okay. And when you have someone that has chronic gout, AKA like over and over and over again, we actually give them something to reduce the uric acid levels. Some things make the, less, the um, acid levels go high. We just have to keep them low and then it will hopefully reduce their episodes. All right. So the, why are we even talking about cyclooxygenases? That's because each of them um, has a specific role. So cyclooxygenase one has a role in protecting the gastric mucosa. It, it causes secretion of um, bicarbonate and mucus. So remember that Pepto-Bismol commercial where you take that pill and it yes. close to the stomach? It's my favorite analogy. I love using it. It's the best way to yeah. kind of picture it. Exactly. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, cyclooxygenase one says, hey, we need more. Peptobismol me and just goes and coats the stomach so that all the acid that we have that helps digest food isn't digested in our stomach because it spills out into our um, into our abdominal cavity, breaks on everything. So that's how we keep it there. And then when it goes into the duodenum, it gets a nice dump of bicarb that neutralizes the acid. But that's what cyclooxygenase one's um, major role is. Cyclooxygenase two actually is directly implicated in pain and inflammation when there is a high level of. Um, um, when cyclooxygenase 2 is activated, it creates prostaglandins. For, for example, prostaglandins E2. That is rolling that, and it makes the pain receptors more sensitive. So it makes, so that's why when it gets red and irritated, you touch it lightly, you want to cry. But when it's not inflamed, like yeah. you can slap your hand all you want and clap, and you won't feel anything. So it just makes those pain receptors more active. So if we inhibit cyclooxygenase 2, we'll will inhibit pain and inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, if we inhibit cyclooxygenase 1, we can affect the gastric mucosa. So that's why we have to think about what we're giving this patient. All right, so we're going back to gout treatment. It's the acute phase. Patient had it for a day. There's mm -hmm. three options. You can give a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug like Advil, indomethacin, I think naproxen, um, Ketorolac, there's a bunch of them. Ketorolac yeah. is actually, if you ever need to get Ketorolac, like, that's when ask, um, Advil's just not doing it, and Ketorolac is pretty good. It's non-steroid as well, so you know, it's good. Um, colchicine, you give usually in a very acute picture if a mm -hmm. patient came in the first hour, uh, because colchicine affects the skeleton of the cell itself. So yes, yes. So cells move for sure, but they do have microtubules that act as a skeleton, because really it's a, it's a ball of water, and if you ever see a balloon full of water, like it has no shape. <laughs> so for a cell to move, something has to like command. You know, your analogies are are perfect. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I do. I break it down, right? So if you give colchicine, it, it, it affects that cell movement. So the cell actually can't move. It freezes in place. Mm. So that's why we try to give it quickly. Because after too long, the neutrophils are in the joint space. It's already dumped all the cytokines. All the inflammation started. So if we freeze them in place, we just freeze in an inflammation that's already happening. Gotcha. So we try to beat it. Yeah. So that's why too long, cold seems is no longer effective. 
and we can get um, glucocorticoids, which is a steroids as well. But you, we usually try to give that temporary. There's a lot of side effects with it. It requires a lot of maintenance, mm -hmm. so we tr don't really try to use that. But the, treat, the role for treating gout in acute this picture is to reduce inflammation. Okay. Not glucolytic acid. Um, in chronic gout, as I said, we want to decrease uric acid levels. And these three drugs, allopurinol, febuxostat, and provenicid, their role is to either decrease uric acid production or increase how much we get rid of out of our body. So either way, we're just reducing levels. But in acute gout, inflammation. Cut yeah. the inflammation short. All right. So we give them an NSAID. Um, the question is, which one do we get? Mm -hmm. If we give them an NSAID, we're going to inhibit cyclooxygenase. If we inhibit cyclooxygenase 1, we can thin the protective gastric lining, which leads to ulcer disease. Yes. Someone that has ulcer disease, it's going to worsen. Yep. Like if they have the abdominal pain every other day, it's going to happen every hour now. So we want to give them something that doesn't inhibit cyclooxygenase 1. We want to give them something that inhibits cyclooxygenase 2. Yes. Because that has to deal with pain and inflammation. So if we inhibit that, we decrease the threshold of pain, so we don't, so we can still clap our hands, um, <laughs> and we reduce further inflammation, so it's not as swollen. And yeah. cyclooxygenase three, we find in the brain. Um, we don't really know the role of it. Uh, we don't know how pain, um, like pain medication, really affect that. It's still something that we're discovering. So for now, yeah, when when we know more, we'll talk about it. But for now, just know it's there. <laughs> you know, if they try to throw it in a question, it exists, but for this question, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> All right. So how do we treat this patient? Patient came with gout, history mm -hmm. of ulcer disease. Um, we need to know what we're going to inhibit to treat them. Mm -hmm. We give them a cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, which is celecoxib. Mm -hmm. um, history of gastric ulcer disease. We don't give them colchicine because it has a reduced efficacy as time progresses. And after a day, it's not going to help them. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I said glucocorticoids is normally last resort. There's too much maintenance required. You have yeah. to follow up. There's all the side effects from it. It just becomes a headache. So in a patient, in actually in any patient that has ulcer disease that needs pain relief, uh, think of celecoxib, COX-2 inhibitor. It's just tied to so make that concept and tie it together. Pain relief with ulcer disease, you want to think of celecoxib. If that's not there, think of uh, glucocorticoid as well. Um, that can probably help as, um, with the pain relief without affecting the, the, the gastric mucosa. But at the same time, you really want to look for that cyclosians 2 inhibitor. All right. Um, and that's really it for this week. Um, as I said, we talked about the arachidonic acid pathway. We talked about how they kind of navigate it. You know, there's a nice picture about how the prostaglandins, what, how the prostaglandins affect everything. You can think about the fact that if you give them an inhibitor, um, like a cyclooxygenase inhibitor, you can actually inhibit the, um, decrease the uterine tone, which can actually delay labor, which is why we give them endomethacin yes. to um, when a patient comes in, in labor, we give them endomethacin to postpone labor, give them that steroid shot to help mature the lungs. That's why endomethacin is used for that. Wow. Yeah. All right. Ties connected. So much. <laughs> Put it all connected. together. There you go. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Heckburn. Um, you did a great job kind of dissecting the question, and I see where I went wrong. So I'll definitely <laughs> be taking notes from this presentation. Um, other than that, guys, uh, please make sure to follow us on our social media. It's just at SJSM underscore medical school. We post a lot of USMLE prep questions that you could see on your step one exams, as well as any tips and tricks to kind of pass the exams and kind of get prepared to be better physicians in the future. Um, again, thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing everyone again next week. All right, great. Yeah. All right, take care, everyone. I thought you were going to have hide me. That works too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>